Hi, this is Sapil Bharti and we are here at Open Source Summit in Vancouver. And today we have with us once again, Clyde C. Prasad, General Manager of Linux Foundation Training and Certification. Clyde, it's great to have you back on the show, but in person. Swapnil, it's always a pleasure. It's particularly nice to actually sit down in real life uh, after many, many Zooms. Let's talk about some work, you know, and which is more or less like, um, give us an update because you folks keep coming up with a lot of reports. So talk a bit about what's new that you are doing here at this event. So from a training perspective, we're really excited. We made a significant change this year in our big annual research piece. So we had been doing a research piece annually called the Open Source Jobs Report. And this year we've modified it and took a bigger palette to say, what are the tech trends for employment? In part because so much of tech employment involves open source technologies anymore. So it felt overly limiting to just think about things in terms of open source, when in practice, you know, the entire public cloud is running on open source. You know, a lot of the uh, stuff that seems sexy, whether it's generative AI or you know, digital finance and distributed ledgers or, or edge IoT computing is open source. So we reframed it to really think more broadly about what are the, what are the challenges in the tech talent landscape and what are the trends? And so that report, which is the 2023 tech talent report is now out and available for folks to, to go take a look. And what was interesting in seeing the data is there are a few things where you might believe things are happening that the data suggests the reality is a little bit different. So we could maybe talk a little bit about reality versus perception when it comes to opportunities in the tech sector. Yeah, so let's talk about reality. First of all, uh, last year we started seeing a lot of layoffs, cuts were happening. But if we, you know, once again, uh, not get stuck with the news cycle, during COVID, a lot of companies are over hiring also because they were like, you know, that talent shortage there and everybody is moving to the cloud. So talk a bit about, do you see that, you know, this is like, you know, finding the balance of layoff and also what kind of people are being laid off? Because when you look at the layoff, people also get scared. Hey, Tech sector, no, I don't want to get the tech sector because there is no market there. So once again, reality. Well, I think the reality is that a lot of the talent hoarding happened at the largest companies that have the stock options that seem really juicy and attractive and which themselves had found religion in remote hiring. So, you know, COVID taught people that remote work can be super productive. And the folks with the deepest pockets went out and found talent in places that they typically had not been looking for talent. And then as things tightened, they looked at their budgets and said, mm, can we afford to keep all this talent on the bench? What's interesting is the smaller companies, the smaller and mid-sized companies got out hustled during the great sort of move towards remote work because they were naturally the old catchment area for a lot of these folks when you think about the secondary markets that are not the Bay Area or Austin or Bangalore. Uh, but they got muscled out of the market. And so they never did get their share of the remote workforce of this new talent pool. And with this latest, you know, if you read the headlines of the really big tech companies pairing back what was arguably overstaffing, two things are happening. One is uh, the, the small and mid-sized companies are actually quite happy to be getting access to that talent pool. And in fact, many of these folks are ending up at those types of organizations uh, pretty quickly, right, after, after the uh, action at their previous employer. Uh, so there's that a rebalancing of where the opportunities lie um, that I think maybe gets lost a little bit, right, when you see the headlines. The other thing that was different, and we saw this in the survey results, is historically people tend to think of layoffs as affecting very heavily the frontline folks. This time what the data suggests is that layoffs were much more skewed towards mid and upper level, more senior type folks. And that companies are reporting that even after having done staff adjustments, in 2022 and early 2023, they're actually planning to hire, but they're planning to hire more at the entry level developer cybersecurity type levels than necessarily replacing the mid and senior level managers, which actually creates good balance in the market because a lot of what those smaller companies haven't had is those mid and senior type folks because they haven't been able to afford them or attract them. So in a way that the market's returning back to what we think looks like a little bit more normal balance in terms of where people get employed. But interestingly, the entry-level piece remains in pretty high demand. 
which is not what you would think if all you did was read the headlines every day. As you were initially talking about the change in the in the report, you know, trend the larger trend in the markets, not just specific to open source. Was there something you know, anything that stands out or some where you feel, hey, this is what we are seeing different this year? The shift towards more entry level talent, I think, is is a big one because what has happened. If you think about like the move towards cloud-based technologies, everybody wanted to hire people with experience because the technology felt new and like you needed to hire somebody who knew what this was. And as they've a little bit further along the adoption curve, they're more comfortable now thinking about hiring more junior folks and giving them an opportunity to thrive. So I think that's an interesting dynamic that maybe we haven't seen for a while. Um, the other is that, uh, companies are starting to realize that you can't just chase the one big thing. So when we looked at the data, three technology areas really stood out and as companies recognizing that they need to pursue all of them simultaneously. Cloud computing, which is not new, that's been true for a while. Cybersecurity, which is not true, but has been coming uh, more and more to the fore in terms of, of the threat matrix and uh, AI and of course, boom market for all things generative AI, right? But uh, I think what we've seen in the past is uh, there's been one sort of big thing, right? If you think about the first wave of virtualization uh, with the emulators and then the wave of containerization and, and orchestration, uh, the pace of technology, right? There are three major things happening right now in parallel with each other. And so companies are really having to try to figure out not just the one next big technology move, but across all these dimensions with taking legacy apps and moving them to become cloud native, thinking about security for everything, right? The supply chain, the, you know, the ingress attacks, and thinking about what, how can we harness the power of some of these generative AI and big data models. Uh, it, you, it, is, it is daunting to think about, especially if you're not a very, very large corporation, how are you going to position yourself for, a, for advantage when so many things that are new are happening all at the same time? I, I've kind of sometimes wondered, you know, at the pace new things are coming out. We cannot wait for the next batch of college graduates which will come out five years later. Uh, we need workers now. And also at the same time, a lot of developments in robotics and automation, that also means a lot of jobs, which are manual, manual, they will go away. And when we look at the employment or unemployment numbers, they sometimes scare you as well. I sometimes wonder, you know, why can't we, you know, like the, a lot of these folks, you know, be trained to work in the tech, tech sector? Is it like a, a pipe dream or is that not a reality at all? I was just at our training and certification booth chatting with a guy who is about to graduate from one of the universities here in British Columbia. And I asked him, I said, how much of these new technologies did you learn you're about to graduate from this computer science program? And he just looked at me and said, none. They told us about that this was going to be important and they telegraphed that we should go do some work extracurricular on it to figure out what is a GitHub repo? What does a pipeline look like? You know, what is an orchestration layer? What, how do I use it? but they're not covering it, right? So the solution is not gonna come from the degree granting programs. The solution is gonna come from either non-traditional paths into tech or from taking folks who are already within companies and figuring out how do we add that skill set? Because the only way that you can deal with multiple frontiers of new technology coming at you at the same time is to leverage those technologies. You know, people get intimidated by some of the generative AI stuff, but isn't that the type of tool that you need to be able to make people super productive so that you can work on this whole array of new technologies simultaneously without uh, massively you know, reconfiguring how your business gets done so you can make people much more productive? I think the storyline of the importance of these productivity tools to being able to adapt to a world where technology just keeps coming at you faster and faster, gets a little bit lost among the sort of panic of, oh, well, what all jobs are gonna go away? Because look at this, you know, whether it's uh, code pilot or whether it's just the GPT chatbot writing code. 
the first instinct is to think that's scary. I think the second instinct is to think, hmm, I'm going to need more of that type of productivity tool if I'm going to be working on five, six, seven different high potential initiatives simultaneously. Can tech sector be become a workplace for those who are not in tech? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And it's one that, that I have some firsthand experience in because we have a team member right now who has been doing amazing work with the uh, generative AI APIs to look at how we can create content and generate um, some automation behind that. And he is self-taught. He was a welder two and a half years ago and had always had an aptitude for technology. And his uh, wife actually encouraged him to take it up and in fact up applied for him for the job for LF. Really hidden talent pool, right? You looked at this guy's resume and you would never have thought that he would be a candidate. You multiply that by hundreds of thousands of people, right? So can we get an on-ramp for folks who, for affordability or access reasons, have not had the opportunity to go into a college-structured program? Turns out those programs aren't covering some of the technologies, but there's this really large pool of people with the innate potential to do these types of jobs. And through training, through certification, through mentorship programs, we can create a separate pipeline for those folks to come in and start being productive pretty much on day one. So talk about the role that you folks are playing in kind of preparing that kind of folks so that the hiring managers can also look at, hey, yes, that person is certified to, to, about this X technology or as, a, as, as an employee, I'm like, hey, I do know this technology so I can apply for this job. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things we've figured out is you need to create multiple pathways as you think about building talent, because there might be some people in your organization who have been working on these technologies on their personal time and volunteering or through some other mechanism, and they might be ready today. And if they can pass a certification exam, you can have high confidence that they can come in and be productive. You might have somebody who is somewhat ready, has had some exposure, but needs a little bit more structured training on the specific tools. If you think about something like Kubernetes, before they can then be ready to take and pass a certification exam that, that signifies that they're at that level. Or you could have somebody that's working in the stock room that has an aptitude for this stuff, but is gonna take maybe you know, nine, 10 months of, of structured training programs to get all the way there. And our answer to most folks has been to say, you need all of the above, right? A single strategy is not gonna get you there. There's no the single strategy a lot of companies have been using is try to hire for the talent gaps you have. And we're not saying to stop that, but what we're saying is you need to use everything in your arsenal. You need to think about who might have the skills already that you can validate those skills and get them in. And that's a very short term within the next month. You need to think about who the people that have potential and have been exposed. And if you put them on a structured path with the, with the right training, they could be ready in three or four months. And you need to think about the folks who are maybe completely outside that talent pool right now, but they're loyal, they have some aptitude, and you could put them into a learning path that might be a little bit longer, nine to 10 months out, and be doing all of those things in parallel all the time. Because what we know happens is as people get skills, they get attractive in the marketplace, not everybody's gonna stay. That can't be the reason that you don't invest in your talent pool because people turn over all the time, right? You have got to think about how do you replenish this using all these different strategies? Otherwise, you're never gonna feel fully staffed. You know what happens when you're not fully staffed? People get burned out and quit. So, you know, it's a really, it's a circular firing squad problem. If you don't think about managing your, your talent pool holistically over multiple cycles and doing multiple different ways with multiple different time horizons of getting people into the talent mainstream. Because you don't stop as soon as they get, you know, accomplished on the cloud native frameworks, they have to start thinking about cyber. As soon as they get you know, up to speed on that, they have to start thinking about generative AI and then they have to, something else, right? It, this is not a, a event, right? This is a process, uh, there's a continuous process. You know, people talk about continuous delivery of code. This is continuous delivery of talent. You have to constantly be thinking about what's coming, what's relevant to my organization and how am I gonna get those skills into my organization? using multiple modalities instead of relying on, I'll hire it when I need it because that's what happens. Everybody tries to hire at the same time. 
it's great, you know, if you're a PhD data scientist, it's a great market, right? You're gonna get a phenomenal job offer, but it's not healthy for the ecosystem as a whole. And it's frustrating for companies because they end up not having the right talent and they can't move as quickly as they want to move. And the mindset of thinking about multiple strategies for growing organic talent is something that you know, some companies have started to do really well. The data suggests that more companies need to be doing that well in order to get to a really healthy place. So, so are you like seeing some positive trends in this direction or do you feel that no, we need a lot of education to tell hiring managers that no invest there or you're like happy that no, things are moving in the right direction? It's, it's funny, it's somewhat similar to what happened when, when DevOps uh, started being embraced, right? But most people realize that DevOps was primarily a cultural change phenomenon, not a tooling phenomenon. And it took a couple of years, and then people got used to this idea that collaboration was better, visibility was better, r- rapid deployment was better. And I, I feel like we're in a, a similar stage where the initial cultural reaction to, ooh, that's not how we do it, let me tell you 10 ways it won't work, we're, getting, we're beginning to see the end of that stage and people moving into, oh, actually, if I can make this work life better for me, it's better for my colleague down the hall. So how do we make that change in terms of the behaviors? Because the one thing that this model requires is more internal mentoring and tutoring of those people as they come through, right? And so there's an investment in mentoring these folks because they're not coming with five years of experience, but they are coming with a lot of historical knowledge about how the business works. But there's still some technical mentoring, which from a change management perspective is probably the biggest thing that's different for the folks who already have those skills in the organization, that they will be asked to take on more of a mentorship role to bring these people and help them get up to speed. Uh, The old model where they bring somebody on who is completely up to speed, what's not to like, right? I don't have to make any more effort, but that's not a model that's sustainable, right? And so we're going to ask more we're going to ask for more mentorship from the folks we have. And that's probably the biggest cultural change and operational change you're going to see to be able to implement a model like this. Right. Thank you so much for taking time out today. Not only share this report, but also the larger you know, changes, trends that are happening in the industry. Thanks for those insights. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Swapnils. Always a pleasure.